So I'm going to make a start and say welcome everybody to this webinar, Collaborating Towards Food Data Interoperability, a technical deep dive. It's great to see all of you here. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, obviously, introductions are already underway, so thanks for keeping those coming in. Um, I should introduce myself as well. Um, my name is Sophie Patterson, and I'm working to coordinate a food data collaboration project coming soon here in the UK. Um, a few familiar faces and some people who I haven't met before. So great to see all of you. So just a quick reminder as well that this session is being recorded and it will be made available on YouTube for anyone who has missed it live. So hello to anybody who's watching on YouTube. I'd like to just yeah share quickly what we're going to be covering over the next 85 minutes or so. Um, so we're delighted to have Rachel Arnoux, Francois Tobelin and Clementine Trebaillot from the Data Food Consortium in France with us to share aspects of the technical side of their food data interoperability journey so far. And um, before that, we're going to hear from Gareth Hughes with an initial technical uh, overview of the food data collaboration scheme here in the UK. In fact, I lie, that's going to be afterwards and I've just misread my text, Gareth, don't panic. <laughs> Before all of that, though, I do promise we are going to hear from Lynn Davies of the Asian Food Network UK. She'll be setting the scene for us with an overview of the food data interoperability roadmap to date. Um, we have promised a technical deep dive, so it is probably going to get quite technical um, at various points in the session. So don't be alarmed. Um, we're also going to be keeping at least half an hour free at the end of the session for questions and answers. So do add your questions to the chat box as we go along. We'll be collating them and keeping them all ready um, to uh, get stuck into uh, at about five o'clock or so. So a few people just trickling in. Um, if anybody else would like to introduce yourselves as you, as you arrive in the chat box, that would be great. Um, but I'm gonna hand over here to Lynn. Excellent, all right, diving straight in. Um, <laughs> sharing screen. Okay, cool. Yeah, awesome. Great to be hosting the second webinar on this project, uh, Food Data Collaboration, um, and it's really exciting to see Familiar faces, thanks for coming along. It is a technical one, so we had a lot of people uh, who were happy to avoid the technical details of this, um, and that is absolutely fair enough. So for those of you who have braved it, thank you for your boldness and your technical uh, aptitudes. Um, so I'm just going to set the scene a little bit, as Sophie said, um, and then we'll get into the actual techie bit after me so it's not you know we've got some breathing space first um so yeah setting the scene for this short food supply chains have some problems this is why we're stepping into this project because as the open food network uh who i've been working with for the last six odd years um we are really getting to grips on some of the problems that are stopping short food supply chains from scaling uh, and hence that's the driver for this project uh, one of the problems that we've seen, so I've got a few uh, examples of some problems, including some real producers who are really experiencing them. Um, one of the key problems that we see is that we have a number of platforms uh, that exist in our world um, and uh, producers, when they have to, when they're selling stock uh, into short supply chains, they're often selling across multiple platforms and it happens quite quickly, a few different kind of projects, food hubs, uh, yeah, community-led food businesses in the area, suddenly producers are having to manage their stock across multiple platforms. And if that means that it sells out in one place, they need to update somewhere else, time-consuming, error-prone, if they oversell or undersell, both of these things cause problems and create admin overload further down the line for someone else. So, um, yeah, maintaining a catalog across problem across platforms is definitely one of the problems that we're starting to experience. A second problem that we're, we've kind of noticed coming about in short food supply chains is this distribution logistics and how there are many, many small businesses running distribution routes that cover the same area. And obviously, uh, distribution logistics is one of the biggest expenses for small 
uh, small food enterprises trying to get the food out to people. It also is a key source of emissions. Um, and so cutting down on those actual trips. And in fact, you know, if you look at the stats on shop food supply chains, uh, people talk about how they're actually less carbon friendly, carbon efficient than long supply chains. And this is part of this problem that you've got these like repeated trips going round and round. So these are some of the challenges that we're looking to start finding solutions to. And it is a real barrier to scale, you know, like our little part of the food retail sector is probably less, well, I would say probably less than 1%, but, uh, you know, other people, there's different numbers thrown about, it's hard to tell. Um, and it's a problem now. Uh, and so, like, if we want to try and get some of, uh, try and transition where larger scale farmers start uh, transitioning to agroecology and supplying alternate food systems, uh, which, you know, recent research by Sustains that, that most farmers do want to do. Uh, it, we can't expect them to try and manage their stock across a million different systems. And these systems, you know, we're not just talking, say, food hubs and veg boxes. There's also the procurement sector. There's the hospitality sector. There's direct sales from farm. There's point of sale in shop systems. There's spreadsheets that people manage on the farm. You know, there's a lot of different tools that need a lot of different data. And if you're putting that data in, in all of these different places, so you're going to spend a lot of time doing it. So, um, yeah, it's a massive barrier to scaling our sector, and this is, this is a problem. So, uh, what we're talking about here is about building collaborative infrastructure that's going to enable this. Um, it would be obviously far simpler if all of these digital systems could talk to one another. And so there's a few ways to do this. Um, if, you, if you're looking at data interoperability, you know, you could just create one-to-one -one conversations between platforms. That creates this exponential problem if you're trying to do hundreds of platforms all with one-to-one -one conversations, uh, ex data exchanges between them. There's the model that we see most often in the marketplace where the winner takes all. So you get a big dominant player like Shopify and everybody just works to their standard. And it basically just concrete, it cements that uh, that player's position within the marketplace. And more often than not, they're the ones with the, the big bucks behind them, probably being quite extractive and certainly not creating wealth within communities as they go about this model. So this is why we're looking for this interoperability approach with the open standard, um, where we're all kind of talking to this common language between each other. Um, yeah, and so doing this, obviously, it will have a lot of challenges, and this is what we're embarking on. There's clearly a governance challenge to this, which is not the point of this talk, but I do want to just touch on it briefly. Um, the governance challenge around this, you know, can we build a shared vision for short food supply chains? What does that actually mean to build that shared vision? And then to invest in the infrastructure around it, to sit together at the table and continue to build this shared infrastructure with a commons type approach. You know, it's, it's no small problem and it certainly hasn't been something that uh, potentially many of us are overly practiced at. So the governance challenge is going to be a significant part of what we're exploring. But to be honest, can we afford not to do this? I, I think um, when you look at how COP's been going in Glasgow and the lack of leadership that's being shown in addressing some of these fundamental challenges of our times, it really to me shows more and more that folks like ourselves have a significant role to play in uh, what this transformation looks like. But what we're really here for today is the technical challenge behind this. Um, and so the kind of roadmap as it's been mapped out so far over a multi-year period looks at kind of starting to take product catalog and stock problems into account um, and create that interoperability, then moving along to uh, looking at orders and who has ordered what and when to deliver it. And that will lead on to being able to optimize this logistics problem, which we also touched upon at the start. Um, so, you know, getting this full interoperability to really uh, create this, the potential for transformation across our sector is quite a long old journey. Uh, we're actually starting here where, with our planned pilot project that we are looking to begin next year, and it's a two year project. And so this is what we're going to focus on today. I've got another thing for that. Yeah, so today's agenda, we're really going to be focusing on authentication. So how do we manage who can access which data? 
looking at interoperability, how do we match products across systems? And we have our French friends here to talk to us about what they've been finding on their journey with this, because because doing a, a massive and difficult projects like this, it's always good to be able to learn from folks who are a few steps ahead in the game. So very excellent that we have this uh, privilege. So yeah, that is everything from me. Hopefully sets the scene a little bit. Uh, and now, who am I passing on to? Rochelle and Francois? Uh, yeah, indeed. Thanks very much, Lynn. That's great. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel, and I'm part of um, a group in France called the Data Food Consortium. And um, yes, so we have been uh, working on interoperability for uh, now two years, a little bit more than that, actually. And um, the starting point, uh, which we all already grasped a little bit in our first webinar, but just to give a very short overview, was really around existing platform in France, um, trying to um, work with the similar producers and having a lot of issues around shared product catalog, but also, as you mentioned, Lynn, uh, logistics and, and um, other topics of collaboration issues. Uh, so we um, gather uh, quite a lot of um, platforms around the table to talk about this problem. And especially at the start, we had the food assembly, which you maybe um, know um, in the UK, uh, but also um, the Open Food Network and uh, the Suclio platform. Suclio is a very big platform in France, especially around um, uh, local um, uh, government procurement uh, in terms of uh, delivering food to uh, canteens and so on. Um, and what was really the starting point uh, of bringing all these platforms together is, is local and short food chain systems and how we, we could better collaborate and, and build a, a standard. So um, from this starting point, we, um, we basically gather ourselves around some values around we really want to be able to um, improve um, the um, environmental impact of short uh, uh, food system um, organizations. We want to um, publish everything we are doing under open source licenses. And uh, in all this, we want actually short food system to be able to scale and actually become um, bigger than they are today. Um, the, this slide shows you um, actually who are the partners today. Um, we have some active contributors um, around, first of all, the virtual assembly. So the virtual assembly is um, a nonprofit organization based in France and specialized in uh, semantic web. So to build our standard, we chose to, to work with semantic web uh, technology. Uh, so we are going to deep dive in a little bit more in, in this and the virtual assembly is one of the key as experts in France around this type of technologies. Um, and we, we have um, also a lot of institutions like INRARI who are mostly um, research um, institution who you might know as well and who are also helping and, and contributing to, to the project. Uh, the rest are uh, mostly French, very French platforms, but you might know as well Open Food Facts, which is a, an international database on, on products. All this work that we have been doing for, for two years has been financially supported by the city, um, the region of the city of Paris, Ile-de-France, um, and some private foundation, Foundation um, Carousel and, and Foundation Massif. Uh, so a, a very French uh, picture and scene, but um, our work never intended to remain 
uh, French. <laughs> so we always documented everything in English. Uh, we are super happy that um, uh, there are discussions starting in the UK. We also have very good feedback from groups in, in Belgium. So um, yeah, uh, I want to pick up on, on one Lin Sen on governance. Today, um, the, this group is facilitated by the Open Food Network in France, but we are looking to create a, a separate uh, non-profit initiatives to to structure our our um, work um, and uh, yeah we'll be happy to also have this discussion uh, with you guys and, and see if actually we are building something very French or if we there is ground for um, building something more European given the nature of our work. Last but not least uh, I wanted to mention that uh, so far we have with the main contributors a lot of active and older platforms uh, but we are more and more contacted by um, actually startups who are building their platform from scratch and um, and, and base basing their, their their work on our our standards so we don't have logo for for them <laughs> to show yet on the, on the slide but uh, that's the spirit. So um, a little information on how we structure our work so far. Um, first of all, so for those of, of you who are not familiar with semantic web, there is one approach that is very important to remember is that we have basically two different worlds that are um, structuring together. An ontology, so it's basically um, a, a, the version of the standard which is really focused on describing all the processes um, that um, implies when working on, on and using uh, a platform like uh, the ones we are looking at. So it's really focusing on describing the businesses, describing everything that uh, come into place. And then there is a technical um, uh, and very practical development of of a product that is based on this ontology. So we really have two, two different words and it's really interesting to work this way because we could focus for a while on uh, just describing processes. What is a product for a pl platform A? What is a, pr a product for platform B? I will share the link to, to, to this uh, work in, in the chat later on. And um, on the side, we started since a year now to develop a prototype to understand how um, we could um, practically build um, tools and, uh, and interoperability between platforms. So this is where actually we started also working on our technical ontology, both um, directly on, on the main uh, documentation and also improving the ontology on 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 the on the go, but also by by just building a prototype which is available on GitHub, and which allows us to play and see how different platforms can communicate, either being a platform that already exists or a new platform uh, coming into place and wanting to uh, interoperate with other platforms. Uh, this ontology is a living thing for now. Um, we are not changing every day um, the, the, the ontology, of course, but my main message on this is that we might have done mistakes or there are stuff that we might not have found when we tried to see what was already existing. So uh, we really welcome contribution on, on that front. Also, you need to know that we 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 started uh, our work and without trying to be exhaustive, but also moving along uh, as as we were moving forward with with the project. So, uh, for for example, we focused on a subset of use cases. One of the first use cases was mentioned earlier is really the the problem of sharing product catalogs and stock information between platforms. So this is one of the use cases we, we, we worked a lot. And the second one was 
uh, the logistics side. But of course, there are many use cases to an interoperability standard, mapping, and et cetera, et cetera, accountability. Um, but we needed to choose something in order to move forward step by step. And um, last example on this is that um, we also, within um, a particular theme, uh, worked also step, step by step. So, for example, for the product sharing um, problem, uh, we first started to think about how we are going to work around uh, authentication uh, between platforms, who has the right to see a, um, a product catalog, who has the right to um, to um, to edit products and how do we link product together so on on that front we had a lot of discussion with um, gs1 and how they were approaching this for uh, general distribution platforms um, unfortunately their model was not um, something we could apply directly to um, to short food chain system. However, um, there are some interesting uh, input from their standard in terms of, for example, how to describe a product. So in the early stages of our work, we, we and you will see it in the prototype, I will do a short demonstration. We never uh, really cared about getting um, the description of a product, right? We first wanted to set up the infrastructure and all the authentication problem and, and, and flow basically between platforms, right? And then focus on what, what type of data was shared. And now that we are approaching this phase, we see that we, we didn't um, describe in our ontology the product very well. So this is an ongoing task, for example, that we are going to rewrite a bit the product um, box in our ontology. And of course, we are going to, um, based on work on how GS1 is, is working, but we also had uh, found two other ontology where we could base our, our work. So we it's actually, again, uh, an ongoing thing. And also on the more meta level, the, the ontology might change a little bit because we were contacted as well by another community you might know um, called Value Flows. They are maintaining an, um, an ontology that is um, describing economic um, flows of, of value. It's more meta than what we are doing, but we are also exploring how our work can complement their work. So again, just to say that um, this, um, the task of building a standard is, is something that um, uh, can really um, still evolve and, and contribution are really welcome on, on that side. So um, to maybe to finish, and I'm sure you will have questions and it will be more practical to, to go through them. Um, I will show you a, a quick demonstration of um, our current uh, prototype. Uh, I want to stress that um, our goal with this prototype was not to um, have um, a, a product to sell uh, very fast, but really to understand where was our were our problems in our current work, uh, where we we needed to to change our ontology, where platforms were having problems to actually adapt to your standard and and iterate. So this this is really our uh, the role of our prototype, and of course. If in the future it can become some something else, we will see. But for now, we are really working this way. So you will see again, uh, for those who were there at the first uh, webinar you saw, it, it's not a prototype that is very sexy, but because, yeah, it's not, uh, it's, it's wrong. Um, in the first webinar, I, I demonstrated how we worked on linking products to one another because uh, one of the problems we were working is how to uh, know that on plat platform A, this product is the same as in platform B. This link can be done automatically, especially when you create a product from A to B. But if the product is already present in A and B, you need to manually 
link them. This link is done manually for now in our prototype because we 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 think this is a use case that will only exist with existing platforms. And in the future, the more we move forward, the, the less we will need this um, this manual linking because we would mainly create products from one uh, to another. Um, but what was not ready yet in July was that um, we could read a product catalog, but we could not write um, on a product catalog. So this is now uh, finished. So I will demonstrate this aspect of the prototype. So without uh, further um, aspects, um, this is how it looks like so far. So we are, we worked with a standard for authentication called uh, OIDC. We will um, detail a bit more uh, during the question if you're not familiar with this standard. And um, we also work with, for now, with the scenario that um, the person who logs in is the person who has the right uh, towards the data. Often we take the, the example of the producer, a producer logs in and look at his product catalog and do action on it. But we have many uh, use cases in France where producers are actually in contract with the platform and the platform can take upon uh, the responsibility to, to do some actions like updating stock information. This um, is not totally um, uh, finished yet, but we have this in mind. So this demonstration, just imagine I'm a producer and I'm logging in to the prototype to do actions on my catalog. And um, one uh, last thing on, on this authentication ask, aspect, which you see here in the uh, URL, uh, we are on um, a platform called uh, Les Communs, the, Co the Commons. Um, the Commons is a non-profit organization in France uh, who they host a lot of um, open source tool and especially they offer to the French community an OIDC server, which is an authentication server based on uh, OpenID Connect standard. And uh, they offered first to, to us to use it for free. Uh, now we are looking uh, to actually give them a contribution because we, they really helped us a lot. And, um, and it works for our governments because they, we, we know them and they are really um, 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 value aligned with, with what we are doing. But um, um, this is a topic maybe for the future of, uh, of the work and what you will be doing in the UK, but um, a, um, an own authentication server can of course be um, imagined. So, um, oh, I was already logged in. I, I tested my demonstration. How thoughtful was that? All right. So this, this is how um, our prototype looks so far. And what I will do, like I said, so I will just select one platform. So we are going to I'll be playing with the Clio's platform today and import um, their catalog to actually have um, a view of um, what they have in store with our uh, produ producer, the producer I used to log in. So here I can see um, that I have some products. So we are so far uh, using a, a test database in, in French. I'm sorry for that. Uh, but I can see that um, now I'm, I'm reading from this prototype um, product from the Suclio platform, which was uh, my intention. And just to be sure um, this is right, I'm going to actually log in the Suclio platform. So it's um, a, a demonstration platform. 
um, when I'm trying to log in, you can see that I have the option uh, to log in with uh, Likoma, so the um, uh, authentication server we saw. And if I do this, um, as I'm on the same browser, I'm instantly logged in on their platform as well. Their platform is only in French, sorry for that as well. Um, if I'm looking at my product catalog on their platform, I see that um, I have exactly uh, the same products that I can see here. So apparently this is working okay. This product that I underline here is a box of eggs. I can uh, go and edit it. So for example, let's say I am changing, I'm saying it's uh, a 12 uh, box of eggs instead of a six one. Sorry, I have the zoom bar in front of my button. <laughs> ah, come on. Update. And uh, so if I'm going to see my uh, here box of, of six egg, if I reload, I can see that it has changed and it's now also a box of 12 eggs. So uh, this is the big change we had since July is that we can push from the prototype um, uh, information onto the catalog of different platforms. So here I demonstrated only with one platform, but uh, the idea is here that the producers can have several platforms and change information, especially the use case that we are targeting is to easily change uh, stock information um, from, from this view onto several platforms at the same time, or actually dedicate um, allocation stock to to each platform uh, like i mentioned earlier as well um, as you can see we really have a, um, a very um, um, subset of fields that are used here for the prototype but this is really because we didn't focus on um, the quantity of fields we wanted to synchronize but really more on the infrastructure of how we are going to uh, move data from one platform to the other. And I think I'm over time already. Um, I will stop here for the demonstration and we can go a bit deeper afterwards during the questions. And I will drop some link on our documentation in the chat. Thanks so much, Rochelle. You actually have a little bit of time left, if you like. You, you've done so well. <laughs> so it's entirely up to you. Um, whether we want to, to move forward into Gareth's section now. Okay, actually I speed up, sorry. <laughs> I hope <laughs> it worry. was clear. Uh, but uh, let's maybe focus on the question then and have a discussion it would be nicer, I think. Sure, excellent. In that case, Gareth, it is over to you. Uh, yeah, so hi everyone, I'm uh, Gareth uh, Hughes, um, so I'm um, helping out this project uh, from a sort of technical perspective, I've got a background in um, data management uh, delivery, IT delivery, um, and uh, I've actually uh, also worked in uh, local food growing, um, so this is some salad that we grew a few years ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's... Uh, Let's get straight on to talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the schema now. Um, and, um, we say schema, um, really, uh, so the, the, the ontology uh, is written in uh, OWL. Um, people are familiar with that, based on RDF, it's also there in RDF. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty standard graph-based um, so sort of web ontology and um, describing what, what we need to describe, I think, really for, for food distribution. So there's kind of three principal areas to that. Um, products, um, which is sort of hope fairly self-explanatory. You know, it's it's not all food, obviously. I think um, a lot of 
uh, local businesses are sort of diversifying a little bit into, into other things. Um, uh, the, the, other, the other sort of areas are transformation, so what happens to those products, um, and sales operations, which is sort of a little bit related, but not necessarily. Um, so the product area of the model, um, as Rochelle said, this is uh, undergoing work at the moment, but um, the sort of the, the the kind of key things to note really here are um, that we have sort of uh, a product moves through a sort of life cycle of being functional, technical, and then supplied, localized, and physical. So that's sort of different levels of realness, if you like, really, for the product. Um, uh, a functional product could just sort of be flour or bread, um, whereas a technical product will give you some more detail about that. And um, a supplied product tells you where, where, sort of where it's coming from um, and, until you actually get into this sort of localised physical So there's obviously sort of facets to the characteristics that these products exhibit. And you need some dimensions that they can control. So relatively standard product um, ontology. Uh, don't think there's much more to say about that. Um, so transformations. Um, so transformations. Uh, effectively, some products are combined. It's like the products, um, the materials that used to be called, it's actually using something called recipes, which is um, more functional than the materials logic. Uh, it uh, doesn't have, it, it, it combines the routine information with the information, if that makes sense at all. Um, so, again, transformations have the same. The same same set of steps that you would have for a product. You can plan your transformations using functional products. Then you can actually sort of plan an executable workflow with uh, localized products. So you can actually specify where you're going to source those products from, um, and then you can actually realize that that transformation and you know, actually bake your bread. In this example. So, um, so sales operations, uh, sales, sales operations get grouped into sales sessions. Um, so we've got sort of, you know, enterprises will create a catalog for a specific sales session. And obviously that can vary session to session depending on what's available for uh, harvest. Um, Uh, you can create product catalogs at different levels, functional or technical. Uh, it's it's sort of really transparent. Um, um, but it has a defined start and time for a sales session, so that's that's quite distinct. And it doesn't matter if it's an online session, you know, if you're open for orders for a few days for a weekly drop, or if it's a physical store that you just have daily open times. Um, and customers order the products, select whether it's distribution or delivery and how they get paid. Um, yep, yeah, and uh, so yeah, uh, as I said, that's going to happen physically or virtually. Um, farms, markets, that kind of thing. So just, just briefly talking about initial implementation op options, this is really to sort of start the discussion, I think. Um, the, the sort of, the, the two sort of real kind of um, roads we go here, I think, uh, we either try to build 
against the internal engine of the application. Obviously, that's a sort of you know, a more uh, sort of that would be implementing from scratch. Um, it does give us the option to create an API that is built to the DFC model, lowers the technical debt overall. Um, there is also an option to integrate pre any pre existing APIs that are there. But obviously, that, that, that does have some sort of technical debt associated with it. Um, it does have things special more quickly. Um, in terms of implementations at the moment, the DFC protocols uh, implemented in JSON at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the thing that I don't think is really up for negotiation at the moment with the DFC protocol is that it's authentication. So as Rochelle mentioned, the DFC uh, standard uses open, uh, ID authentication, OIDC. Um, so that's uh, independent of platforms um, and it allows a single sign-on across all the platforms as you saw in the demonstration. Um, it does mean that the platforms have to implement OIDC if they haven't already and allow um, the uh, associate with the, the selected service so um, in this case the the french products are utilizing their common which is um some organization um uh promoting strategic thinking for the commons and provisioning it tools that help people to um, uh, implement uh and organize the commons um so uh, Anything Rochelle mentioned, but there is process ongoing at the moment with the French project um, to become an authentication provider within Le Comor. So there's a separate domain that's been implemented now for DFC, um, which is, is quite crucial because uh, that means that there is control within DFC of sort of who can authenticate, and that's really about kind of managing edge management as it were and, and controlling entry to the commons. Um, so yeah there's a there's, there's definitely I think questions about whether that's whether you know being a sort of having a, a common authentication with the French project is desirable or not um, and how that works and what what the edge is of the commons are the work that we So, thank you so much, Gareth. That's great. Um, brilliant. And please do, anybody, if you have any questions please do feel free to put them in the chat as we go along. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing really well for time. In fact, we have got loads of time left for Q&A. So um, please, please do, um, yeah, add your questions to the chat. It might be that we can start off with some that have already come through. I think a lot of them are for the DFC team. So just uh, giving you a bit of a heads up there, uh, Rochelle and Francois. Um, shall we kick off with this one? from Lynn around the purpose of prototype. So the question is, is the intention that producers will use the prototype or is the prototype just for testing and all of that updating will happen automatically between the platforms as stock is sold or updated? I'm gonna pop it in the chat so that we can see it or see it um, just to make our lives a little bit easier. Um, but yes, if if you feel able to to tackle that at the DFC end, that would be great. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Lynn, for this question. Um, so uh, there, there are several answers, actually. It's not a yes and no. The, the 
prototype is really here to have a playground. Um, it's, it's not supposed to be a finished product. However, um, we know that um, at some point we will reach something that is close to being usable and, and we will want to test if this is really working um, in with real uh, uh, data and not the testing catalog we have until now. And for that, we have uh, several producers lined up uh, in France and who are waiting um, and to help us uh, really test proof um, the, the prototype in that regard. And as we know them also uh, very closely, um, maybe, I don't know, at some point we will also let them in exchange use it if it really works to quickly update on their end. Um, the question of uh, automatically uh, synchronizing everything is also on the table. On the table, to be honest, and this is more also a question of a finished product than a prototype, because um, we will see. But that there is once our goal is first to finish the standard. When once the standard is there, there are several options. Either um, platforms are actually um, um, using it to um, talk um, in between each other, so more an integrated version of, of this, or there are actually um, organizations that will start building, um, um, well, something less a pro uh, for a prototype than what we have done so far and maybe um, an entire new services that will help producer um, better manage their stock. And so the aut automatic aspect, I think, is more an aspect of a service that would be built upon what we have done. Um, our goal is really to lay the ground, have the standard working, and then um, is it auto automatical or uh, on the press of a button is more, uh, I think, a, a service question rather than a, a standard question. But um, I'm really happy to, to talk a bit more about it. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, does anybody have any follow-up questions? Or are, we, are we feeling that we've covered that question enough there? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess just kind of getting a real feel for like how how the intention to be it, for it to be used. So like the idea, I, I guess this is what I'm understanding, like when we get towards finished product, it's not a question of uh, asking producers to log into a new platform, a different platform, that that becomes the place that they upload products. Like actually, that's not the intention at all. Uh, if I'm understanding correctly, it's um, it's that these products flow through and you just basically build that connector. You kind of say yes or no with the permission in, say, one of the apps that you use or maybe a third party app that is just for producers or something like this. And then and so this happens behind the scenes and we're not trying to ask producers to do something even more complicated because I think most of us know how hard it is to get producers to use software. Yeah, exactly. So for our prototype, we use a third, par a third party approach because we needed a, a playground and the playground couldn't be um, the platforms that are already in production and use, even if they have demonstration uh, and staging server, this was not enough. We needed somewhere we could play. So the prototype is really this. Um, then um, once we will reach a bit more uh, a stable uh, version, I think we will have several scenarios. For the most active uh, platforms around the table currently, I think um, as they already have partnerships, they will look into something that is maybe completely aut automatic. Like they have producers that already have a favorite platform. They just want to connect uh, this platform to another. So this will be a scenario where the producers continues to uh, see one, one platform. It's just that um, this platform give, gives 
uh, them also warning saying hey by the way you're about to push this is also going to go on this and this and this platforms are you okay to go through so this will need a little bit of uh, ui tweak um, but uh, it's not an entire new um, platform in the middle and this is possible with what we have done so far and also i'm, I'm also saying always producers but in some cases it will be um uh, groups of producers or even the platform itself like i said we have platforms around the table where um they have they have contract with the producers to to act uh, for them so in some cases it it will actually be the platform itself that will push to other platforms because they they have the power over the data they are maintaining thank you so much Michelle. we've got questions flying in thick and fast i wonder if it's worth picking up on some of the most recent ones um so we had a question from dill uh, asking presumably each project or system that seeks to become interoperable has to work to build bridges from the api to their existing systems can you comment on how hard or easy this is likely to be in other words, are you aware of widely differing approaches and existing platforms that would require lots of translation or are most systems quite similar? Again, I'm just going to pop that in the chat um, so that it's all there fresh for us. And Lynn's followed that up as well. She's really interested to have a clear picture about what it means to integrate with the standard. What are the steps for a platform, if it's possible to delve into that? Thanks, Michelle. Yes. So, um, uh, I of course, each platform is different given whether or not they already have experience in API, whether or not they, they have a uh, technical uh, standard um, um, solution that is uh, fit for that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that um, there are two, um, two steps so far on the platforms we have had joining us recently the first step is implementing authentication so it, it could seen as a as a huge step uh first step and maybe francois you can complement on that because it's um, basically managing a different way to log in into your platform however the oidc is really a standard and i think this was also one of the question um it, it, it's the standard on the web currently to to handle uncertification so um it's something um i think all platform will be interesting in looking at whether or not they are interested in dfc or standard or not so this is quite interesting um most major big platform have an oidc integration i don't know if you saw on the demonstration um a platform i took you could log in with like Oman, but also with facebook google and uh, and microsoft all these big actors have an OIDC um, um, uh, login options. Um, so uh, this this is, I think, one of the biggest step because afterwards it's basically basically um, act, um, building an API and and matching it either with the existing API, like Gareth mentioned, or um, actually using this API as your main API product. Um, so it's not something uh, technically difficult from what I understood from other platforms, but again, I will let other technical members of the team um, uh, change what I'm saying. What, what takes us, us time is that we are doing a lot of back and forth on, uh, okay, we tried this, um, how does it look on the prototype? Okay, we, we went on, down the wrong route and we changed. So I think we are at the sixth version of our, our API today uh, on the prototype, but that's because we needed to, to have this journey as well. So for um, platform now coming in and, and looking at the, at the, at least the product aspect of the prototype, it's pretty straightforward. It's, um, half a day to understand how to match the fields and, and producing and endpoints and 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 that's it. I don't know Francois if you if you want to, to add something on that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, Rachel. So, uh, it was uh, pretty clear what you what you said. So I'm Francois, I'm a developer and uh, I'm helping uh, at uh, Data Food Consortium to build and to 
to build the standard. And so, yeah, about, uh, yeah, so there is really two parts. There is one for the authentication uh, based on o OEDC, so OpenID Connect, which is, I mean, uh, it's not that uh, the, it's built on the OAuth 2 standard, which may be more uh, a famous uh, standard for authentication for people, but it's really, really related. You know, it's, uh, there's just some, uh, an extra layer on top of it to build with, uh, to, to deal with, uh, Scopes, for example, which will allow uh, users to authorize uh, uh, platforms. You will allow platforms to authorize uh, some kind of uh, data or not. Uh, a part of that, uh, yeah, about the yes, the, actually the biggest challenge. Uh, how to say for o to, for o OEDC, you can find library to help your platform to integrate it kind quite easily, as it's it's already a standard. To, for the API also, you can uh, find li libraries to help you to render the G G JSON file uh, format we want. But the work we, we have to do is to, to do the mapping between the DFC data model and your existing data model. So this has to be done manually for sure. But the ontology on which we're basing the DFC data model is we build it in a way it's it, it's really open i mean open to any kind of possibility so it shouldn't normally be quite i mean you, you will find all you need to to plug the data model your data model with the dfc data model that's it i hope uh, it was uh, clear but uh, don't hesitate if you have a further question thank you so much francois um now, forgive me, because I'm not the most technical of people. It may have been already covered, but Jill did have a follow-up um, comment as well, um, just mentioning that uh, he imagines that some producers will want to make some products available on specific platforms, but not necessarily on others. It seems like a tricky problem, starting from a particular platform which doesn't know about other platforms. Is there anything that you could say at all on, on that? Yes, so actually we worked at the product level so far. So, so this case is um, kind of already dealt with. The most actually complex cases we haven't experienced yet and um, played with is actually when you want to um, definitely um, not, so for example, have a, a global stock that would be spread across different platforms, but allocated in percentages, for example, um, or, or stuff like this. And, and this, this we haven't reached that stage yet, but it's defi definitely um, use cases we have written down because there are cases like, like this where um, it's, it's, we don't want to have every the same information everywhere we want to have some some uh, particularities but but still maybe some fields are the same like the description um the product uh, name but um, some other are different and i think we will touch space this also and um, when we we will um because i didn't mention or we mentioned it when we uh, talked about the roadmap. We, we we are a lot on on the pr product catalog right now, but in 2022, we want to focus on orders to be able to to look at um, logistic use cases. And for orders, we need stuff like prices, for example. And for sure, the prices are not the same across each platform for the same products because there are also different type of of clients and so on. Um, so it's it's uh, I think a use case we will um, really work on when we reach this stage. And, and 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 also all the problems of then de dealing with line item and not dealing with product anymore and see where this fits. Uh, so yeah, uh, ongoing work, I guess. Thank you, Michelle. I'm wondering if that leads nicely into another question that we had from Lynn, which was around sales sessions. Um, so orders coming in cycles is this something that you found as a big commonality between all the platforms that you've worked with? Um, so uh, yes, at least in France, when we are looking at platforms dealing with the end consumer, uh, the order cycle is a common approach for short food chain. 
Where it's a bit different is when it's not end consumers, when it's companies. So like I mentioned, um, uh, restaurants, um, uh, school um, restaurants, uh, on this aspect, you, you can have regularity of orders, but it's not really dealt with order cycles uh, because it's, it's going to be um, pre-ordered uh, in advance so it's 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 a, a bit different but the features are there so it's really uh, something uh, one of the most interesting st stuff of all this work was the readers really start and 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 discovering that each platform on, on their own was building something for short food chain system that was at the end quite similar and it, it's a good news because all platforms are working with their users so it means that um, uh, they, they are doing their work correctly um, and and that does not really exist in in models found in in the general um, distribution systems so yeah that was quite a nice finding brilliant thanks thanks very much um, moving to a slightly bigger picture uh, side of things. Another question uh, which came in was around product transformations, uh, again from Lynn. Um, so you designed product transformations into your schema um, and then we'd be interested to hear about how this transformation supports complex supply chains, um, guessing things like farm gate to wholesale to retail and potentially building boxes from multiple suppliers. Again, I'll pop that in the chat just then it's nice and fresh for us then. Yes, so um, this was definitely um, analyzed when we first published the first version of the ontology. Now, I'm sure there are flaws in it because we haven't um, used it in the prototype yet. Um, this is really something that will come with orders because uh, then the boxes is a, is a product, but it's also... Um, uh, a, a more finished product that is going to be ordered and sometimes at least in France I don't know how, how it is in the UK but um, the box can be made by the end consumer directly on the platform um, so it's a it's a product that is not fixed um, in the product catalog like any other um, so uh, untouched ground but we definitely want to deal with this use case so yeah looking to learn on that Thanks, Michelle. We've got a big question in uh, from Dylan here. Um, he is asking, just I think checking a few things first of all. Um, the data being managed here is a supplier's product catalog, products, stock levels. This data exists in one or more providers or partners. Is there a source of truth or is it the intention that this state is synchronized throughout this network? So any provider um, can be a source of truth. Modifications of this state can occur on any, oh, bear with me, I've lost the end of the question, uh, on any partner, then they must be pushed by them to all partners with the expectation that all partners remain in sync. So all of these partners must be aware of each other. Any plans for managing failures? Okay, hopefully that's made more sense to you, Rochelle, than it has made to me. <laughs> Thank uh, th no, th thank you for this question, because it has been at the heart of everything we have worked on for the past years, because um, when we started, we, we kind of moved our work into the model of what exists currently in, in other systems. And in other systems, you have um, like a product ID unique, which has unique information, there is a source of truth and everyone is directed to this source. Um, then there is also other models of, for example, type blockchain where the source can be decentralized, but there is still one source. And um, we, for many reasons, we, we, we also haven't uh, gone into, into too much we really chose um, semantic web for um, its decentralization aspect, but also this aspect of we don't need to copy data all over the world like we would do in, in a blockchain model. And um, so we wanted to uh, avoid 
uh, also um, to become um, an intermediary and 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 build build a source somewhere. Um, we are on short food chain systems, so um, the the information should should be known and 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 push somewhere but it, there shouldn't be one actor that um governs the the information in some way so um in all our work we are trying always to to remove that and that question of the source it should be actually um, um a, a data that is um either shared or specifically by the person who owns this data change on some um uh level but there is not one source that governs the rest um now of course like we said that there are some uh, practical aspects to to understand in terms of synchronization um, um cu currently of course many of them have failed but i think we we can count over 150 sales platform in france targeting short food chain systems and this is just sales so we don't have logistics we don't have accountability we don't have um agricultural planification and all all the stuff that producers are using so uh the number of platforms can become uh, exponential and especially if we also decentralize these platforms then uh, the number of of uh request can can be ex exponential and and we don't want to end up in in that uh, space as well so um i'm not saying uh it's a, a foolproof plan so far but at least um we want to explore how to to do it without um having one one source and actually uh or if there, there is one then it's the group of partners that is working together that defines it uh, because for x, x reason uh, we are looking at an interoperability on the territory and this territory um, has a, a central uh, logistic hub that will gather at some point the information and we know that in their flow they, they will use this data at this stage as a photography and as a source but I think these are edge case, cases. It shouldn't be forced by the standard to to force a, a source. I don't know if I'm I'm clear on the on this aspect. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just uh, I wanted to complete. No, it's uh, quite clear. Yeah, it's difficult to explain, but but uh, maybe I have a point here. It's like uh, you know, distributed system. If you want, you can build a centralized system over a distributed system. If all the partners agree on one source, of, this partner will be the source of truth. They can they can build it, you know. They they, they choose the difference is they, they will choose, you know, to do it or not. It's not imposed by the standard. I don't know if I'm clear here, but for example, in the example of the prototype, we did the synchronization and we decided that okay, we allow the prototype to be the the, the source of truth and to put down the data on the platform, you see? So, but it's not imposed here, yeah. it's uh, the point. It's not, uh, but it's, problem, it's, it's a problem, of course, to, or to in, make the exchange between all the platform, but you, you, you can choose and develop. Uh, each platform can decide where the data will go. You know? The user choose what to, uh, if you uh, give the right of, over the data and the platform after choose what to do with it. That's it, thank you. Thanks, Francois. Um, am I right in thinking that that also sort of goes some way to addressing Dill's question here around, um, it's just disappeared from my screen, here we go, um, producers being the source of truth about themselves. Um, you know, are we looking for it to be human relationships that are the ultimate decider of things here? Um, any any responses to this from, from DFC at all in your experiences so far? I'll pop it in the chat so that it's fresh. Sorry, I lost track of the question. <laughs> Don't worry, it should be there for you, Nerisha. And we are admittedly moving from the technical into the governance here as well. <laughs> mm. Um. 
well currently i don't know I, and this is where also experiences from the uk would be super valuable because in france they're currently producers are the source of tools and and they are making lots of mistakes actually dfc came up because of this because um um we have quite a lot of producers that are trying to be there on several platforms and they were trying and they were doing mistakes in how they updated product on on one platform on the other um etc etc so th this is already the, the 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 case with the flat note of like i said there are there are platforms in france now that are starting to to emerge um based on short food chain systems but targeting um, more um uh, businesses and restaurants and so on and in these cases they often have a contract with the producers where the producer basically doesn't say much they they give an, a rough idea of how many carrots and potatoes and so on and so on they are able to to um to produce uh, during a season and then the platforms allocates and 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 sell the products on behalf of the producers um so there there is some automation done in these kinds of platforms where then the platforms have the ownership of the producers one my question if we are still looking at the short food chain system also in that in these cases but um um, I'm not sure if it answers your, your, your question, but um, the, one of the key things, at least in France, of the wolf short food chain movement was to center again at the producer level what we have lost uh, um, with, with big and heavy um, centralized distribution systems. So, so in, in fact, that the source of truth is the producer is um, quite natural in in what we have seen so far. But I'd, I'd be interested to learn more how it it is seen in in the UK and um, and maybe there are stuff to change in how we approach this. Um, again, we are definitely open to that. Thank you, Rochelle. I wondered, Lynn, is there anything that you'd like to come back with on? on that point as well from the UK experience anything at all? I mean I can certainly I think that I put another bulky question clogging up the chat with my questions sorry all um that relates to this quite clearly like this is definitely our experience as OFN is that like the intention is that the producer will be like the star and they will manage their products and be in total control but the reality is that a lot of producers don't want to manage their online system and it's you know just something that they don't want to handle and so that means that very often people who run food hubs or food enterprises they're managing product lists for all of their suppliers and sometimes our experience you know if we're supporting our users our community then um then we help out by doing some updates for the producers um, and that's just the reality of it so my kind of i was wondering if you had navigated that if suddenly we've got a producer supplying multiple platforms and multiple businesses like we already have it on OFN where producers supply multiple businesses and then we have to kind of coordinate between these businesses and if it's then between multiple platforms um and the producer doesn't want to manage their own there's going to be something quite interesting to navigate around authentication like a bit of an authentication map and maybe like i don't know agreements and memorandums of understanding or something but um i wonder if that's something that is starting to cross your radar in france yes so um we have two groups of users i would say uh, we have a group of of users where indeed, so producers are absolutely not involved in, in managing their online uh, appearances, online products. They delegate all this to uh, the distributor or in some cases also the logistic hub uh, because the logistic hub is, is organizing everything from the sale to uh, the delivery. Uh, and in these cases, the people behind managing the data just want to standardize the data as much as possible. So we are in, in 
in use cases where we want exactly the same information uh, of product everywhere, apart from maybe prices and stock, but uh, the product description, how the product is, is presented. Um, well, these users will want to, to just change once for every everywhere and not um, uh, think about any any other aspects um, and other in other cases and I think cases also where the producer is um, sometimes a bit more um, active but I, I guess this is an hypothesis we can leave on the side I'm saying this because they are uh, cases, real cases I'm thinking of are cases where producers are selling on their farm and they're selling also to other uh, locations. And these locations also have power over their, the, their products because they maybe want to present the product in a different way. The pr producer at the farm is going to uh, speak about goat cheese and, and the shop is going to speak about uh, marvelous cheese from the Alps or whatever. Um, but um, from what we saw in these cases is actually that we are not sure we need to link these two products. And maybe these two products are technically just two different products um, in terms of, of synchronizing the fields. Maybe we need to link them in terms of, yes, this is the same producer, um, but um, if everything changes on all the feeds on the product sheet, we haven't found yet a use case where it's really important to, to have completely map the goat cheese and the marble cheese from the Alps. So maybe we have cases where um, this will be important and we really need to be able to link the products and define which fields are synchronized and which are not. For example, maybe we, in that case, it would be to synchronize stock, but not the rest. Um, so this needs to be to be analyzed a bit deeper. But I would say there are yeah two two cases. One where we want to everything is almost so different that we are looking at almost two different product catalog, even if the in real life, uh, the, the product is exactly the same. And, and cases where, because um, there are people centralizing the information, they just want to um, apply this information in, in batches um, and really standardize also the, the this information. Mm, I can imagine like, some kind of expanding authentication thing, almost like when you open up the cookies consent thing and suddenly you've got all these tick boxes. So like, I can also imagine an interesting UX thing around this um, to make this workable. Hmm. Really interesting insights there. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks, Lynn. Um, uh, Jed is saying that he got the cheese example. Great. Um, and that, that this is also reminiscent of, of another type of transformation um, and a cultural one in this case. Um, do, you, do you keep any comments, thoughts, questions coming in? Um, we've covered quite a lot already, uh, but it may be that there are some more questions out there. So I'm going to stop talking and give everybody a little bit of thinking space for a few seconds. And what I'm also going to do in the meantime as well is just in case any of you aren't already part of our mailing list for food data interoperability updates, I'm going to pop a link in the chat, which means that you can join it um, whilst I remember as well. So, we have got a question in from Dylan. Will the standard be publishing API documentation for partners? 
think I answered in, this, in the chat, but Francois, please change if I'm wrong. But um, yeah, we, we try to document the API model each time we change it. Um, and this is where we put it. Yeah, no, it's good. It's right. It's the last version. Thank you. Thank you both. And Pete Russell is asking, what's the financial model for the data food consortium? If it's possible to delve into that a little. Yes. So, so far our work has been uh, supported by, um, like I said, the private foundation and, and um, local governments, um, especially because we, we are kind of in a research phase as well. Um, the ground we are looking at is, has not been, or at least we haven't found other people are doing the same thing so far. Um, so it's 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 time in that is financed into um, uh, well digging, building the standard, facilitating it. But there is also a big part of of the funding that is supposed to go into building the the governance and and also a dedicated structure to um, facilitate this standard. Uh, so this is something we are looking to really kickstart in uh, next year. And and um, and like I mentioned, we first thought about it really at the French level, but maybe this is also something to discuss at the more international level or at least European one. And um, and this model is so so far we are really looking for funds um, and and in order to to. To help us uh, work on that, but part of the governance is will in the governance world. world uh, work. Sorry, we also started to, to um, speak a little bit about how we are going to uh, make um, the standard resilient and independent from uh, looking for for funds and uh, subsidiarity. And um, for that, we there are a couple of ideas that have been mentioned, like um, having um, membership, uh, for example. Um, and we, we are looking at how the, for example, the W3C is working, all these kind of web standard, how they finance themselves nowadays. Um, we ask each platform using the standard to, to give a contribution. Um, so this is explored. Nothing is um, settled yet, um, but it's it's a big part of it. We, we don't want to end up with a standard that can only um, evolve because there, there are some directed funds to it. We want also to, to look at making it resilient uh, on the long run. Um, so. Thanks, Rochelle. And that was a really interesting question from you, Pete. Thank you. Um, Lynn's just added another comment here around wondering if a future financial strategy uh, could include partnerships with bigger platforms like Shopify, Shopify even, um, and, and the fact that that might need strong vision and governance before such partnerships were deployed. Any comments on that at all, Rochelle? Yes, definitely something we need to 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 look at. I think um, part of our governance work is to also, also, and I think this is still ongoing, to really lay down the values we are all looking for. And, and from there, it's, it will be so much easier to go see these big actors. I was mentioning GS1 uh, earlier on, and um, um, one of their model um, to be using um, um, uh, barcodes on products is actually to ask the producer to buy these bar barcodes. And um, for us, this was a big uh, blocker. Uh, we cannot ask a, a producer to to pay um, an identifier on all it, their products, uh, especially in the short food chain. We have so many variants, uh, to, so this could, couldn't fit in our in our model. And um, so this, this was one of the big uh, aspect on where we we started to to dig into something different than the GS1 model and and they understood it uh, quite clearly um, we have really good relations with them um, what we did an event in Paris where we gathered the whole community it was at their location they offered their their rooms um, but it was very clear that there was they were not 
partner. They were just supporting the fact that we were trying to build the standard in, in the way they did it for the, the big distri distribution. Um, so these are examples. Um, but um, I think that um, first we really need to stay and understand what we want to do, how, and it will be then easier to go see actors um, um, and, and see how we can work with them. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, any, any further questions to be added to the chat? I do have one of my own, but I don't want to jump in ahead of anyone. Okay, I'll go, I'll go for it anyway. Um, so it's not really necessarily a technical question, but I'm just intrigued to know from your perspective at DFC, what have been the most rewarding aspects of your technical journey to date? A very good question. <laughs> um, Francois, I will, I will let you answer as well. I think there are several, like I mentioned, the um first seeing that all platforms were actually working on the same uh path toward short food chain was really interesting seeing that actually we can all agree on something and build something together is, is the second one um i think this is the most uh, question the question we get asked the most often is but what why people are and platforms and private companies are actually coming and working together um and um because it makes sense and and i think this this was really really nice to see and um and then i guess being able to to dig into um communication around platforms in a way we haven't seen yet in classical integration but really pushing forward a little bit the interoperability aspect um, is another one um, so it's a it's a it's a journey it's it's uh, but it's really um, um, I think everyone in, in DFC so far in France has um, learned a lot and um, and changed completely how they they saw their their business um, and their their impact so yeah um, thank you so much Michelle Gosh, I've just noticed that we have one minute to go. We've, we've managed to fill all of that time with some amazing questions and some brilliant insights. Um, thank you so much to all of the DFC team there. Um, you've really held everything together with all of your answers and insights. Um, I'm keen that we don't keep people longer than you signed up for. <laughs> so um, what I'll just do is I'll pop again, just a quick link to our mailing list for those of you who would like to stay in touch and who aren't already uh, signed up for that. Um, and I'd like to thank you all very, very much for joining us this evening. It's been fantastic to see so many people here. And uh, please do uh, keep in touch. Let's, let's continue the conversations. And thanks to all again of our contributors this evening. <laughs>